steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus, steal away, steal away home, I ain't got long to stay. What could inspire slaves to take up arms against overwhelming odds, facing a certain and horrific death if they failed? Perhaps these rebellions in 1712 and 1739 are more understandable, given that colonies themselves were less organized and united than they would be after 1787. But surely slaves considering armed rebellion in the early 19th century would have known their cause was hopeless. The Haitian Revolution would change everything about what was possible for slaves who were willing to fight for their freedom. Although this revolt obviously did not occur within the United States, it was too close for comfort in the eyes of many. The effects of the Haitian Revolution would spill over into the United States. Known then as the French colony of Saint-Domingue, the island that would become Haiti was producing 60% of the world's coffee and 40% of the French and British imported sugar in 1789. The wealthy colony was built on the backs of African slaves who outnumbered whites and free blacks 10 to 1. In August 1791, those slaves inspired by the French Revolution, rose up in rebellion. Before the end of the year, they killed 4,000 whites and burned hundreds of plantations. Over the next several years, the San Domingue Rebellion expanded into a full civil war against France. Finally, in 1804, Haiti achieved independence. The oppressed had become the new ruling class. A colony of slaves had liberated itself from European rule. Slave owners in America were made all the more fearful by the revolution's success. They worried that their own slaves might be inspired by the success of African slaves in Haiti. And indeed they would be. Haiti stood as irrefutable proof that an armed revolt by an enslaved population could lift an entire population out of slavery. Thomas Jefferson, who was president during the end of this tumultuous period, was concerned about the example Haiti had set. But the Haitian Revolution also made possible the greatest achievement of the Jefferson administration, the Louisiana Purchase. Napoleon's failure to subdue Haiti led to his decision to sell the massive French lands bordering the United States, lands that would later lead to expanded conflict over slavery. One of the African-American revolutionaries who Jefferson feared had been inspired by the Haitian Revolution was Gabriel, slave of the Prosser family in Virginia's Henrico County. Born in the year that Thomas Jefferson penned the nation's Declaration of Independence, by 1800, Gabriel was a giant of a man. Standing at six feet three inches, Gabriel carried the muscles that came from training as a blacksmith since he was 10 years old. Because of Gabriel's smithing skills, his master hired Gabriel out to other planters and merchants. Prosser also allowed Gabriel to hire himself out on Sundays, which gave him a chance to earn money. It also allowed him to meet with slaves and disaffected free blacks. The energy of America's own revolutionary generation, the success of the slaves in San Domingue in throwing off their oppressors, and the countless indignities and injuries that surrounded his life as a slave fueled in Gabriel a desire to take up arms in the name of liberty. 
in the summer of 1800, Gabriel and his brothers Solomon and Martin held secret meetings with groups of other slaves. Writing half a century later, the abolitionist Thomas Wentworth Higginson described a meeting. The Negro Ben Wolfock stated that about the first of the preceding June, a Negro named Colonel George prevailed on him to have an interview with a certain leading man among the blacks named Gabriel. Arrived at the place of meeting, he found many persons assembled to whom a preliminary oath was administered that they would keep secret all which they might hear. The leaders then began, to the dismay of this witness, to allude to a plan of insurrection, which, as they stated, was already far advanced toward maturity. Presently, a man named Martin, Gabriel's brother, proposed religious services, caused the company to be duly seated, and began an impassioned exposition of scripture, bearing upon the perilous theme. The Israelites were glowingly portrayed as a type of successful resistance to tyranny, and it was argued that now, as then, God would stretch forth his arm to save and would strengthen a hundred to overthrow a thousand. Gabriel had previously purchased arms and ammunition, including guns, shot, and powder. Gabriel and his brother Solomon used their blacksmith skills to turn scythes into swords. One witness reported, after viewing the swords, I have never seen arms so murderous. Gabriel's plan was stunning in its audacity. They would strike on the first day of September. Over a thousand men were to assemble at a brook near Richmond and then march on the city in three columns. Higginson reports, The right wing was instantly to seize upon the penitentiary building, just converted into an arsenal, while the left wing was to take possession of the powder house. These two columns were to be armed chiefly with clubs, as their undertaking depended for success upon surprise and was expected to prevail without hard fighting. But it was the central force armed with muskets, cutlasses, knives, and pikes upon which the chief responsibility rested. These men were to enter the town at both ends simultaneously and begin a general carnage. A letter writer reported weeks after the plot. It was extensive and vast in its design. Nothing could have been better contrived. They were then to have called on their fellow Negroes and the friends of humanity throughout the continent, by proclamation, to rally round their standard. The magazine, which was defenseless, would have supplied them with arms for many thousand men. The treasury would have given them money, the mills bread, and the bridges would have enabled them to let in their friends and keep out their enemies. Gabriel's plan was derailed when instead of an army, an incredible storm was unleashed upon Richmond, submerging roads and plantations and washing away bridges. Higginson reports, The fords, which then, as now, were the frequent substitutes for bridges in that region, were rendered wholly impassable. The brook swamp, one of the most important strategic points of the insurgents, was entirely inundated, hopelessly dividing Prosser's farm from Richmond. The country Negroes could not get in, nor those from the city get out. The thousand men dwindled to a few hundred, and these half paralyzed by superstition. There was nothing to do but to dismiss them, and before they could reassemble, they were betrayed. Two slaves came forward and reported Gabriel's plans to their master. He then contacted Virginia's governor, James Monroe, who called out the state militia. The city of Richmond was in arms, and night patrols across the state were doubled. A troop of U.S. cavalry was ordered to Richmond, and dozens of slaves were arrested. Gabriel himself escaped for 11 days before being discovered on September 24th as a stowaway on a ship in Norfolk. Taken to Richmond, he was convicted on October 3rd and executed on October 7th. Gabriel's cohorts included slaves, free blacks, and some white workers as well. One or more French nationals may have been involved, 
which drew comparisons to the revolution in San Domingue and had Virginians all the more fearful. Dozens of slaves were executed or sent to the West Indies. One of Gabriel's co-conspirators, a fellow slave, made a speech at his trial. I have nothing more to offer than what General Washington would have had to offer had he been taken by the British and put to trial by them. I have adventured my life in endeavoring to obtain the liberty of my countrymen and am a willing sacrifice in their cause. And I beg as a favor that I may be immediately led to execution. I know that you have predetermined to shed my blood. Why then all this mockery of a trial? Governor Monroe sought advice regarding the penalties for the slaves from Thomas Jefferson, who was then vice president. More than two dozen slaves had already been executed. Jefferson wrote to Monroe. Where to stay the hand of the executioner is an important question. Those who have escaped from the immediate danger must have feelings which would dispose them to extend the executions. Even here, where everything has been perfectly tranquil, but where a familiarity with slavery and a possibility of danger from that quarter prepare the general mind for some severities, there is a strong sentiment that there has been hanging enough. The other states and the world at large will forever condemn us if we indulge in a principle of revenge or go one step beyond absolute necessity. When the executions were over, the legislature responded to the planned rebellion to reduce the ability of other potential revolutionaries to meet and plan the Virginia General Assembly outlawed the hiring out of slaves. Additionally, free blacks were required to petition the legislature for permission to remain within Virginia or else leave the state. Virginia's growing population of free blacks had encouraged slaves to think of freedom for themselves and Virginia planners could not allow that. Gabriel's plan may have been audacious, but its thousand-man army never marched. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.